of our course, but since he is the expert on this, I think it's a, a very special occasion. I'm certainly looking forward to his talk myself, and the talk is Misconceptions About the Gold Standard. Thanks very much, Professor. I apologize to anyone that might have heard this uh, before. This was a speech I gave in London at the uh, Cheviot uh, Sound Money Conference at the end of February. So I know Alain and Philip were there, and Keith, and I know that uh, Frank has also heard it on the, the internet, so I apologize if it's repetition. Okay, very good, very good. Fine, <laughs> I got that there. Um, okay, so it, it's, it's a pretty broad, broad talk, you know, it's, it, I'm, it, it's not a specific talk, um, but I'll be covering a number of, a number of points. Um, the first one is um, that there is insufficient gold for economic activity, whatever that means. Uh, the second one is that gold fixes the price level. The third one is the origin of the gold standard and, the, and its apparent failure. And Professor has already talked a little bit about that. And the last uh, point will be uh, failures of the current system and what the gold standard alone can't do. Okay. So um, we all know um, we all know of the Austrian school and. Um, what we, what we all don't really appreciate is that the, the, the true father of this school was Karl Menger Barnum. Karl Menger Barnum. And he didn't write anything in, a, in, 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 in the form of a mathematician or a physicist or an engineer. He wrote purely from philosophical principles to begin with. And his philosophical axiom, which founded the school, was value does not exist outside of the consciousness of mankind. That was exactly how he phrased it. And in English, uh, there is a, well, that was in English, but in English there's an idiom saying that beauty does not exist. Sorry, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Okay, so that was the, uh, the founding axiom, and it's the only axiom that applies in economics. Nothing else can be considered an axiom in my view. So this gave rise to the, uh, the concept of marginal utility. If you as a human being encounter a, a proposition, you see how many different ordinal uses you can have for that particular proposition. So water, for example, can be used A, to quench your thirst, B, to uh, water, give, give water to your pet, uh, C, to uh, I don't know, wash the dishes, D to water the flowers, you know. And the marginal use is the, is the, is the, is the, is the use that determines the value, you know. The, most impor the least important uh, use for that particular proposition is what determines its value. So that's how marginal utility was born. So the concept of money doesn't, uh, is not excluded from that in any way, and um, barter, barter was what defined the state of uh, human interaction, and money, whatever it was, was promoted, uh, whatever substance it was, was promoted naturally amongst the interactions between, between people. Now, you have to say to yourself, well, does this, uh, does this substance, does this substance exist, you know? And you have to say, well, surely it has to exist, just like the largest number exists in a set of numbers, you know, you can't deny that. You have to say, how does this substance exist? It should exist in vast multiples of the amount of this substance produced, if it can be produced at all. And is there a vast difference in this respect between the substances under consideration for money? And there is, just as there is a vast difference between the sun and all of the planets. And we know what that substance was, and the substance was uh, gold. So that's it, period. 
Now you look at gold in terms of stocks to flow, like we have done previously. You arrange all commodities by this stocks to flow metric. Gold and silver stick out like sore thumbs. The next commodities along the spectrum, along the spectrum are magnitudes smaller from, uh, from this stocks to flow perspective. And stocks to flow is just the way that marginal utility expresses itself in the physical plane. So a, a substance with near enough constant marginal utility, the, the, the result of that will be that it has an extremely high stocks to flow ratio. It doesn't have a high stocks to flow ratio, which implies it has a constant marginal utility. It's the other way around. OK. So um, I'm actually going to be addressing comments made by a uh, what I call a mainstream linear economist. And uh, well, I can tell everyone here. His name's Martin Wolf. You know, and uh, he writes columnist in the financial in the Financial Times. Times you know, Do Dr. Martin Wolf, and um, he said something um, along the lines of this. He said the problem is the mismatch between the uh, value of official gold holdings and the size of the monetary system. So, so this basically means that he thinks that the size of the financial system, which you can say is determined by the total number of financial liabilities, is somehow restricted by the amount of gold that there is. There is some kind of linear relationship. If there is X tons of gold, there has to be Y you know, dollars worth of financial liabilities or something like that. So that is just wrong. It's, it's just an incorrect assumption and he's just wrong. Um, and I will go through why he's wrong. Now, the state of the development of financial assets and liabilities, and I'm going to introduce a Latin term here, is purely ex mentis. It's from the mind. And as far as I recollect, there is no restriction to, to what the mind can do. So that's the first point. It only has productivity and human intellect related to the, its boundary, you know, and there is no limit to that, in my view, with sufficient education. <clears throat> so the collective subjective determination of the arrangement of monetary resources, whatever they may be, required at immediate demand against what was not, was the principle behind the birth of the deposit mechanism and its associated counterpoint of the bond market. Okay, so I will go through this in a lot of detail because I know that people do get confused on this matter somewhat. Um, and a consequence of this is, is, is fractional reserve banking. If you, if you want to deny fractional reserve banking, then you have to uh, deny the concept of interest. And I know there are people who, who like to do that. And, uh, well, let's just leave it at that. So, uh, <laughs> so they, 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 they don't like the concept of interest. They think it's usury or, or whatever. Okay. So we need to go through an example here as to just, to just show that there is no restriction to the amount of liabilities and consequently assets as well in the financial system under a gold standard. Okay. So I'm going to start with uh, John. And John has a monetary balance. And this is his monetary balance. John's monetary balance. So this is X ounces of silver, which John has. And John uh, goes to the bank. Uh, I've just realized that that is actually too big. I need to... Okay, this is John. John's monetary balance. Okay. 
And there's a certain amount of silver, a certain amount of gold. That's not really relevant to this discussion. But John decides that uh, he wants to keep this much on demand. Now, demand basically means either keeping the, the coin in your pocket, you know, or the bank literally just acting as a custodian for your, for your money and charging, charging you an annual um, a fee to store your money. So he decides this. He wants this proportion on demand. And this, he is uh, he's willing to lend out. He's willing to lend out. So he, uh, he finds someone called James. And he lends the money to James. James wants to borrow the money. John wants to lend it. They agree the particular rate. And then uh, James, so it's lent money. The time part of the is lent out. Is that all clear? Not the demand part. <coughs> lent, lent to James. Okay. And out of that action, a bond was created, payable by James to John. Call him James. Him. Okay? So, lent to James, that's your first liability that's created out of that. Okay? So James has got this money. James goes and proceeds to spend that money with Tony. Tony. So now we have Tony's monetary balance, which just happens to be John's time balance as it were, this part here has ended up now as Tony's monetary balance. But lo and behold, now Tony is in the same position as John was in the first place. Okay? And he decides, right, I, I'm going to do something similar to John. He doesn't know who John is. Um, <coughs> not relevant. And says, I'm going to keep a different proportion on demand not necessarily the same. And this is Tony's monetary balance here. <coughs> and Tony finds another chap, Brian, who wants to borrow. So he lends money to Brian. And I have a bit more to say about all of this lending stuff a bit at the end of it. Brian spends the, the money with uh, Matilda. And I'm not bothering to talk about the duration of these bonds, the duration of the deposits. It's not really relevant to this, to, to debunking Wolf's assumption here. So, um, where have I got to? Tony's monetary balance led to Brian. Brian spends the proceeds with Matilda. Right. So now, Matilda has, and by the way, this is all at the margin, obviously. Marginal. So now Matilda has a monetary balance and lo and behold, she can do the same thing that Tony did with his monetary balance. Oh yeah, and I forgot to say that another liability was created here. The liability from Brian to Tony. And so here we have Matilda's monetary balance. And this is all from the same amount of gold. 
I must re-emphasise that. Matilda's monetary balance. She wants to lend a proportion of that out, lent to Florence. Why is it that Tony doesn't have a liability? Is it not the other way around, Tony to Brian? Okay, yes, yes. No, no, it's, it's Tony's monetary balance. He's lent the money to Brian, so yeah. the liability is from Brian to Tony. Oh. Yeah? yeah but what about James? Uh, the liability is from James to John. John is J Prime. I should have not done. I, you can just. I'll just call it L one, L two. You know, from who it's not, obviously the liability bit will be from someone to someone else. I knew subscripts might. Okay, uh, <laughs> but anyway, from Brian. That is. That is. That matches, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So lent. Uh, lent to Florence. Florence spends proceeds. with tin. Okay, and obviously there was another liability um, created here. A liability from Florence to Matilda. Okay. So, um, you can see that I can take this process to infinity if necessary. Obviously, it's not going to go to infinity, but this is called the principle of recursion. Very, very important concept. Um, and we see that from the same amount of uh, gold, a whole, a whole uh, inventory of bonds, of different durations, you know, all subjectively determined is created. Okay, so there is no limit to the amount of the L's that can be created from a from an initial amount of gold or silver or any substance. Okay. So you might say, well what's the determining factor in all of this? Okay. Can anyone See what the determining factor to the amount of liabilities might be? It's the, it's the ratio at each stage of how much people want on demand versus time. Okay. If everybody wanted to keep only a minute, minute, minute fraction of things on demand, zero. say zero, infinite. There would be an infinite uh, size of financial liabilities in the in the financial system. So basically, the determining factor is not the amount of, of of physical substance in the in the system. It's this subjective determination here. Okay, yep. is that clear? No. Now. Um, what happens is that you end up with a financial system, you know, which has a, uh, on the liability side, it will have a, uh, a certain amount in demand, and you will have various um, time deposits of differing maturities, so 1, 3, 6, 12, 24, say. And all of these have been subjectively determined. And of the, the amount of cash corresponds in the financial system should correspond to the amount that's required on demand. So you can take sort of like there's the concept in physics called uh, center of gravity. And um, you come up with a number which basically means that you can do all of your calculations through this point. You don't need to consider it, the Earth, as a, as a sphere in three dimensions. You can consider it as a point. And so you can also calculate the center of gravity, as it were, the, the weighted average level of demand versus time for the system. And that will be composed of 
infinitely many subjective preferences at each stage. And of course, it will come out with a number at the end of the day, you know, just like infinite, you know, a vast array of numbers as an average, okay? Um, so there you go, okay? There is no restriction to the amount of financial liabilities under a gold standard. Uh, I'm not talking about bills here, per se, I'm talking about bonds. No restriction. So that's him debunked, he's got that wrong, you know, tick, okay? Is that all clear? We can have questions later, but if there's anything that's really not obvious, you know, let me know now. Yeah, I've got something that's really okay. not clear to me, Sandy. As far as you go down in this iterative process, am I correct in assuming that even as far down as you go to the very bottom, that still has to conform to the actual specific time preference at the top of James's? Oh. No, 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 it doesn't. No, it doesn't necessarily. No, you don't, you don't need these to be of shorter durations than James's, the original name. So if he comes back after 90 days, which is the time stipulated, he stipulated, mm -hmm. where is his 90 day, where is his money going to come from if, if the other ones don't conform to that same... Oh, well, it, Tony is not relying um, upon this system to repay the loan. He took, uh, whoever it was that took the loan, uh, James, you know, James has whatever method he has for amortizing the loan, you know. James could have borrowed the money in order to build jet engines, you know, with uh, Rolls-Royce, yeah. you know. He's not relying upon uh, the terms that he's taken the loan on. He will know that he will be able to repay it, otherwise he wouldn't have taken the okay. term of the loan, basically. Is that clear? Rudy? These are not self-liquidating loans, they're paid off externally. Yeah. That's you know, there's a huge economic system behind here, you know, which means, you know, that he will, he will pay it off however he pays it off. He will pay off the, the, the jet engine loan mm -hmm. when British Airways buys it. And is that the specific, the, what is it called, the uh, specific gravity point, whatever it was you were talking about? No, that I was saying that if you consider demand versus time for each of these people, yep. You will end up with a um, a sort of average demand versus time for the whole system. Okay. You know um, what happens is is that the Baal Accords basically say, well, you only need to keep. They did, first of all, if someone deposits money into a bank, there is no <coughs> distinction between how much, unless you say so, how much is kept on demand versus time. Yeah. They're free to lend out. Um, 90% of it um, at whatever, for what, on anything, for whatever duration. You know, they only need to keep 10% in cash, let's say. Now, that obviously uh, usurps the uh, natural determination at each stage. Sure. Okay. So, um, I didn't leave enough room, uh, so I'll do it down here. But this... Pro, this is the mechanism behind the create. So yes, cost. sorry, one thing. So, on, what about marginal? Can you explain it better? What do you intend? To marginal, I mean by the sense that Tony, this is a mar the marginal increase in Tony's balance, in the sense that Tony already has a monetary right. balance, you know. Right. So, I'm talking about what's happening at the margin in this case. That's all. <coughs> not not, not uh, more, more complicated than that. Um, this is the mechanism, the principle of recursion is, is the mechanism behind the creation of the, um, the floor of the interest rate. This is the time preference element in action. So James, who borrowed the money, imagine a credit exchange here. Exchange. James, let's say, was sitting here willing to borrow at 5%. And uh, Brian, Brian, let's say four and three quarters, and uh, Florence, Florence, let's say four. And as each of these things were created, it was crossed off, as it were. And Peter, whoever Peter is is now 
at the margin, the, the, the one who's determining the interest rate floor. Okay? So uh, this, is, this, is, this is a, um, a variation on the creation of the bid and the offer spread here, talking specifically about the interest rate. So I've talked about the floor. I'm not going to talk about the ceiling, you know, but that is, uh, how is the ceiling of the interest rate determined? If the floor is determined by time preference, how is the ceiling determined? No. Really? The marginal productivity. Marginal, marginal productivity. Okay, so I've just given you one half of the, uh, but this is sufficient to show that the, the number of financial liabilities is not restricted <coughs> by the total amount of gold. It's purely a mental process, and that's the mental process here. Okay? So there we go. That's the first, that's the first point that has been debunked. So, the dispersal of gold coin through the spending of loan proceeds creates a system comprised of demand deposits and time deposits of varying maturities. The, the determination of the proportion of any individual's gold that is required on demand versus on time is a purely subjective process, and it's certainly not the prerogative of the institution charged with deposit-keeping duties. So when one hears the following kind of comment, it is wasteful to hold 100% reserve in a bank. Banks have a strong incentive to lend some of the money deposited with them. They're missing the, the point entirely. Okay? You can, and it's quite easy to see how they are missing the point. It's not the job of any bank to determine this. Whose job is it? Yours. The one who owns the gold sets the rules, okay? So this obviously presumes a certain level of erudition in uh, matters financial, which the public don't really have, and that's their fault, you know, it's no one else's. Um, so, and we've also shown that the reserve ratio, which I define as the total amount of physical gold to uh, both demand and time deposits, um, was dependent upon collective subjective determination and there was no restriction to it. So setting a reserve ratio by diktat usurps that natural mechanism. Okay? If I wanted to keep 50% on demand, but the bank by law only needs to keep 10%, well then there is a certain amount of financial liabilities and assets that have been created that would not have been created were things subjectively determined. And this is a concept that Wixell talks about, Nut, Nut Wixell, in Interest and Prices. The concept of a, a natural rate, as it were, an unobservable, as it were, rate, versus a market rate and the distortions between the two. So this is kind of a, uh, a variation on that. Okay, so um, another, another often held belief uh, about the gold standard is that it fixes the price level, you know, and um, that uh, that is for one desirable. Professor has said many times it's not desirable. You know, a computer would still cost about five hundred thousand dollars in in today's money. You know, if it if that was the case. Actually, the first one I think was millions of dollars in nineteen fifty something money. Yeah, you know. And it had less less capability than whatever was in your wristwatch. Well, one one transistor cost ten dollars, and now you can buy ten billion transistors for a dollar. So, uh, if you wanted, <laughs> computers would be damn expensive, basically, if, you, if, if, if this was the case. So, you know, with this mechanism here, you know, have I talked about prices anywhere in this mechanism? What's the only thing that's been referenced in this mechanism? It's the interest rate, okay? Specifically, the floor of the interest rate. So, uh, I'm not referring to prices in here, and... It turns out that the gold standard has nothing to do with price level stability. 
is to do with the stability of interest rates. Okay? And one of the benefits of having a stable interest rate structure is that the price of reproducible commodities, wheat, corn, and all of those things, tended to be stable. But that was not the defining characteristic of the gold standard. It was just a pleasant consequence of the gold standard. So don't confuse that aspect of it. Uh, the, uh, and I've talked about this already, but uh, you know, it's, it's purely about the interest rate. And you want a stable interest rate as an entrepreneur. Anyone that is an entrepreneur will know that they want a stable interest rate. Now, pro, uh, I don't know whether we'll be talking about it this series, um, but a declining interest rate structure is, is just as, uh, it, it's, it, it's, not, um, it's not as pleasant as it might sound, you know, not by any means. Um, for example, you know, if you, uh, if you took out a loan at a particular rate of interest um, and the interest rate was in a declining environment, you will be outpriced by a competitor at some point who has a much lower cost of funding. And in, the, in a declining interest rate environment, um, not low, declining, that will have the effect of destroying capital, effectively. Yeah, Whether say, it, most entrepreneurs don't understand this because they're just as ignorant mm -hmm. as the rest of the people and it's their own fault. Well, yeah, that's sad. It doesn't stop them from making money, though. But you know, they should still know about it, though. You know, <laughs> you know. So, so for example, very quickly, you know, a popcorn maker, if he's borrowed money at ten percent, and interest rates go to nine percent, you know, his competitor shop, uh, sets up shop, starts selling popcorn at a marginally lower price because he has a marginally lower cost structure. The first chap won't notice anything. Obviously, if he wants to sell his popcorn, he has to sell it at the price that the next chap is selling it at. You know, <laughs> otherwise he won't sell any uh, popcorn. But then that chap is, 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 is in the same position if the interest rate falls further. So they each have to start selling it, as it were, at lower prices in order to clear their good. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, bang, your capital is gone. You know, you're bankrupt. You're selling it at a price that you can no longer afford to do. So interest rate falling, interest rates falling, is not as beneficial to the economy as it might sound. Okay, so uh, we talked about that, and I hope that was, that was all fairly clear. We're going to move on to the next one now, and Professor has already talked a bit about this, and this caused a few gasps in the audience when I did it, when I said it in London. Um, so many claim that the banknotes evolved from the goldsmith's receipt. And the story goes something like this. Our ancestors, in all of their wisdom, decided that carrying around pocketfuls of gold was conducive to being robbed. They would rather deposit the gold coin at the secure facilities of a goldsmith and carry around the goldsmith's receipt for use in payment. From this state of affairs, the goldsmith took advantage of his position. Since the goldsmith's clients were not redeeming uh, receipts for cash gold on a consistent basis, the goldsmith issued many more receipts than there was gold on deposit. Now forget about how he got these into the system, but this is apparently what happened, um, according to this story. Uh, when there were redemptions from uh, bloated receipts um, in excess of the goldsmith's gold holdings, they would shut their doors and declare bankruptcy, and all depositors would be left with fractions of their original deposits. And the nefarious goldsmiths were apparently the, uh, the predecessors of today's bank, banks. Now, um, as Professor alluded to yesterday, all of that is more likely rubbish than it is truth. You know? And as Professor said, it presumes that there's a sense of idiocy and naivety to our ancestors, which they didn't have. You know? The mechanism was much more subtle than that. So apparently this goldsmith's receipt was the origin of the banknote. The banknote never had any such origin. And if you hear people saying that it did, you know that they don't know their potatoes. Okay? A banknote never represented gold at a particular place in current time. Always represented gold at a particular place in the future. Okay? A very small class 
of receipts would represent gold on demand. Okay? The banknote was the banknote represented the movement of gold, as it were, not its static location. So then there's another question that obviously arises from that. The failure of the gold to be present when it is supposed to be. Now, if the banknote represents bills of trade drawn on consumer goods in urgent demand, then there is hardly any question of this failure. The instrument of the bill is self liquidating. liquidating. Okay. The bond and its repayment mechanism does not necessarily have this feature. You know, I don't repay my mortgage by selling my house. You know, I repay my mortgage through my income, from my <coughs> job, if you're lucky enough to have one. Okay. Um, so that is the difference. Gold on the move has a completely different value to gold sitting in vaults gathering dust. Gold's movement can be capitalised in paper form, and the safest form of capitalised paper is the real bill, where the underlying good is guaranteed to turn. To turn means to be sold. Okay? The banknote in its original form was just the representation of that bill in convenient uh, multiples. Now, a German professor by the name of Rittershausen, Heinrich, wrote beautiful, beautiful pieces on this, and uh, you can get some of his essays on reinventing money. Uh, dot com. Thomas Greco's Thomas Greco's um, website. And Rittershausen gives the example of the Scottish banking system and the development of Scottish trade and the miracles that are performed in Scotland. So I will urge you to go to reinventingmoney.com and download his essays. Um, so banknotes, just like the real bill, uh, were originally ephemeral entities. You know, they did not exist permanently, uh, which were meant to bear the equivalent of interest, you know, and they adjusted it such that that was the case. And Bank of England notes had different classes of notes which exactly did this. They bore interest, as it were, I mean, not interest, but the equivalent mechanically to, with an expiry date upon which they liquidated into gold. And it was the duty of the note holder to claim the gold or do something else with it, not the bank. The knowledge is certainly not new, um, and it was formally espoused in the decried doctrine of the old bank directors of 1810. And that stated that notes should only be issued on bills of trade, and they were more cautious than 90 days, they said at no more than 60 days to expiry. So that's the decried doctrine of the old bank directors of 1810. Sadly, those bank directors don't get out much these days. So you might have to ask how the banknote issue fits in with the system of um, deposits and the bond market, as I showed here. A growth in nominal credit outstanding these L's, say, will have the effect of increasing the demand for that class of good which can have real bills drawn against it. So if there is a credit explosion for whatever reason, there will be a certain class of, of, of goods which will have a certain spurt of demand interest and which can have bills drawn against them. But those bills will disappear just as quickly as they appeared. Not like the concomitant bond that was created at the same time. Okay? So you increase credit for whatever purpose, by fair or foul. There will be a nominal demand, one might expect. You know, if, if there's a credit splurge, there, might be a, there won't be a demand for more toothpaste necessarily, but there might be a demand for, I don't know, you know, a faster car which takes more petrol. You know, so the volume of real bills will consequently increase with this expansion in credit which is happening for a fair or foul purpose 
but those bills will just disappear just like they're normally supposed to. These bombs necessarily won't, though, you know, depending upon whether they were created for a fair or foul purpose. So that's how the real bill interacts, as it were, with that um, the bond, the deposit mechanism. It's more to do with the the turning of the deposit mechanism. It's not, not actually related to the deposit mechanism itself. It's a completely different, different beast. So the Bill of Trade was the consequence of economic activity and endeavour, not the cause. These were, the, the bills, etc., were, were, were sort of the receipts of good work, as it were. You know, they, they were the consequence. You know, they didn't cause economic activity. Again, that puts a hole in Keynes as well as, as, well as Wolf. Okay? So, um, I hope that's cleared up any confusion that anyone might have had about the origin of the banknote. You know, it was not to do with bloated receipts from uh, evil goldsmiths or anything like that. It was a, the, the progression, and Professor's going to talk about this tomorrow, was a lot more subtle. Instead of issuing bills against uh, banknotes against bills, they would issue banknotes against things which had no guarantee that the underlying good, if it even existed, would ever turn. Okay? But more on that tomorrow. So failures of the current system and uh, what the gold standard alone cannot do. And for, for this, I refer to um, Dr. Honig of the Federal Reserve. And he recently said that we're not going to have fewer crises necessarily under a gold standard. You will have longer periods of price stability. So we've already dealt with that. That's irrelevant. Or price level stability. But I don't know that you will have lower unemployment. I don't know that you'll have fewer bank failures. Okay. So um, we've already dealt with the assumption that the gold standard works on the price level. It doesn't. So let's tackle the next assumption that there will not necessarily be fewer crises. This is perfectly true, but has nothing to do with the gold standard but correct fiscal discipline. Dr. Honig's comment about crises is equivalent to saying that shifting the deck chairs on the, on the Titanic did not have any positive effects on its survival. It's a pretty obvious statement, you know. I certainly don't need someone to tell me that. But that is the class of his statement. So we've gone through the time deposit mechanism and the bond mechanism that's associated with it. And we've shown in a perfect world that the individual with his subjective preferences should determine how much of their money went on demand versus put out at time for a consideration. So how does the current system differ from the way it should be? And I've already um, alluded to this as well. When you deposit money into a modern day bank, there's no distinction given by the bank between how much of that is required on demand against time. It's just considered a deposit, for which only a certain re uh, reserve level need to be kept according to Baal, dicta uh, Baal dictates. 